Hello, I'm Dr Natasha De Vere from the National Botanic Garden of Wales. I'm going to be telling you a little bit about the conservation and research work that we do at the Botanic Garden, in particular our work on saving pollinators and science and society. The Botanic Garden is dedicated to the research and conservation of biodiversity, sustainability, lifelong learning and the enjoyment of our visitors. We are a big site, we have over 200 hectares of land, a plant collection with over 5,000 different taxa. Our great glass house houses plants from Mediterranean climate regions of the world. We have a systematics garden, a garden that concentrates on Welsh natives, a bee garden and apiaries. We also have Wineglass National Nature Reserve. So alongside the formal botanic garden, we have the nature reserve, which we manage as an organic farm. We're particularly proud of some of our grassland habitats. We manage these as lowland hay meadows, and they are full of wild flowers and the most amazing displays of orchids and butterflies, and are truly beautiful to experience. We're working at the moment on our conservation strategy for the next decade. The work that we do is informed on a global scale by the, the UN Sustainability Goals, on a national scale by the Wellbeing of Future Generations Act and the Environment Act. And we have four core themes, saving plants and fungi, saving pollinators, international conservation and research, and science and society. I'm going to be telling you most about saving pollinators and science and society. But I wanted to share just a tiny bit about the work we do on saving plants and fungi. We aim to conserve some of Wales' most threatened plant and fungi species. A lot of the work we do concentrates on providing a science evidence base for conservation action. We also do practical conservation work where we will reintroduce species which have become critically endangered or extinct in the wild within Wales. We have recently established the National Seed Bank of Wales. Again, we will concentrate on the Welsh flora, first of all collecting the threatened plant of Wales and then gradually extend until we have the whole of our Welsh flora safeguarded within our seed bank. We're committed to using those seeds both for their long-term conservation but also for conservation and restoration activities as they are needed now. One of the big areas of research that I've been involved with since I started at the garden almost a decade ago is looking at DNA barcoding. This uses short sections of DNA to enable an identification to be made from a, a single fragment of leaf or root or pollen grain or seed. First of all, we need to make a reference library of known samples with their associated DNA barcodes. At the Botanic Garden, they led the project that made Wales the first nation in the world to DNA barcode all of their native flowering plants. Since then, we've gone on to DNA barcode the rest of the UK flora. We use that for a whole range of different applications, working on individual species groups or developing new methods, to doing projects, for example, like looking at the pollen within the atmosphere and relating that to people with hay fever and asthma. But a lot of the work that we do over the last few years has been on pollinators. And pollinators need our help. Habitat loss, climate change, pests and diseases, insecticides create a perfect storm. This causes a decline in wild pollinators and ill health in our managed honeybees. And we have a multidisciplinary approach to what we can do about this at the Botanic Garden. We do research on which plants do pollinators visit. We look at gardening for pollinators and pollinator ID in terms of education and training. We have a bee garden and pollinator events throughout Wales. We're developing seed mixes and a saving pollinators assurance scheme, which I'm going to tell you a little bit more about. Our research focuses on which plants do pollinators visit. And it seems like an easy question, but it's actually quite difficult to understand exactly what plants are important for pollinators as they go through their whole life cycle and throughout the seasons of the year. 
So we use DNA to answer that question. The pollen on a body of a pollinator or within a honey sample provides a record of where that pollinator has been. And we can use this to understand what plants are maybe most important to them. To give you some examples of the type of research we do, here is some work done by PhD researcher Andrew Lucas, and he looked at hoverflies. Uh, he used field sites throughout Wales, looking at species-rich agricultural habitats, and he looked at what hoverfly communities were within those areas um, and what plants that they were visiting using DNA barcoding. It's also really important to us that we work within the Botanic Garden and we use that as a study site for research. Another example of our work is Abigail Lowe and she's doing her PhD looking at wild pollinators within the Botanic Garden. We want to understand what uh, hoverflies, bumblebees, solitary bees, the plants that they use within gardens and amenity areas. We sample the pollinators each month and we DNA barcode the pollen on their bodies to find out what plants they're using as the season progresses. We're also looking at developing seed mixes um, and looking at how good annual meadow mixes are for pollinators. Uh, planting an annual meadow mix of seeds, uh, which provides a beautiful, aesthetic, colourful display of wildflowers, is often a really popular way of gardening in gardens and amenity areas, particularly kind of urban sites. We're interested in how good are these annual seed mixes for pollinators and can we make them even better? We're testing commercial mixes and we're making our own. We use DNA barcoding to see how those seed mixes are being used and how the pollinators interact with the surrounding landscape. As well as wild pollinators, we do lots of work on honeybees and we are developing the Honeybee Centre for research, training and engagement on honeybees and beekeeping. The research that we do again focuses on the plants which honeybees use. Within the botanic garden, we look at what plants honeybees are using throughout the year and we look at this over multiple years to really understand what plants are important within the honeybee diet. The graph that we have here shows you a month by month impression of the plants which the honeybees are using. And what we see is there's actually quite a small number of plants which the honeybees use really, really regularly. With both our wild pollinators and our honeybees, we can look at are those plants native to the area or are there certain types of garden plants which are particularly important. We also look with our honeybees on a UK wide basis at the plants which honeybees like to use. This is an example here also of the type of research that we do. We would like, um, we ask beekeepers to send us honey samples from throughout the UK so we could see what forage was being used. In order to do that, we went on a national gardening programme and asked for people to help us. Our results were really fascinating. We found that in 2017, the most important plant for honeybees was bramble, Rubus fruticosus. We also found a data set from the 1950s and we compared that to see how the world had changed from the point of view of a honeybee. And what we showed is basically the honeybees told us the story of agricultural change within the UK. Whereas bramble was the most important plant in 2017, it was white clover, Trifolium repens, which was more important in the 1950s. In the 1950s, this would have been a key component of pasture and grazed grassland. But the way that we farm in the UK has changed. We use more herbicides, we have less permanent pasture and more rotating grasslands which have much less floral diversity. The honeybees couldn't use white clover anymore so we think they moved on to bramble, Rubus fruticosus instead. We also changed, we also observed the, the change in crop species being used within the UK. In the 1950s, the honeybees used hardly any brassica species. But by 2017, oil seed rape is a major crop and is used by the honeybees much more. 
We also showed the increase in use of invasive plant species. Himalayan balsam, Impatiens glandulifera, is a plant which was just beginning to spread within the countryside within the 1950s. By 2017, it is a major invasive species which spreads over vast areas of waterways. But the honeybees really like it as a nectar source, and we see the increase in use of it within the honey samples. We hope that this story of what the honeybees tell us about agriculture can be used to increase floral resources across the whole of the nation to provide nectar and pollen for pollinators. And we provide training in beekeeping, but also products of the hive. So you can come to us to learn how to make soap or lip balm or even how to make wax flowers. Our Saving Pollinators Assurance Scheme brings together our research along with our commitment to help Welsh horticulture. We know from our research which plants pollinators like to use best and often we see logos which say these are good plants for putting into your garden for pollinators. But there's a problem in that a plant which is labelled as good for pollinators may have been grown in peat compost. It may have been treated with synthetic insecticides which could harm those pollinators. So our assurance scheme aims to change that. We work with Welsh growers who are committed to producing plants without the use of peat and synthetic insecticides. We look at the plants they grow and then we find the plants which we know are really good for different groups of pollinators. Our logo, if it's present on a plant, represents that that plant is good for pollinators and is grown without the use of peat or synthetic insecticides. It is genuinely a plant which is good for pollinators. Our final area of work that I wanted to talk about today is science and society. And we have a big programme at the Botanic Garden looking at the importance of plants and gardens for the health and well-being of people, wildlife and the environment. This is something which we've seen during lockdown. During the coronavirus pandemic, many of us were at home and only allowed out for a short amount of time for our daily walk. And we saw a huge increase in people's appreciation of the natural world. The ability to see the changing of the seasons, to see what's happening in your surrounding area over time, helped make people feel more grounded. There was a huge upsurge in interest in gardening within the UK, from growing a few wild flower seeds to growing your own fruit and veg. And that connection with the natural world, we seem to think, is being sustained after lockdown has finished as well. This gives us the idea of biophilia, the idea that we have an innate connection to the natural world and it helps to sustain us. There's a good scientific and policy background to the importance of plants, the natural world and gardening for our mental and physical health and well-being. We have two major projects within this area. Our first one, Growing the Future, is a project over five years, we're just over halfway through that, that aims to use gardens and gardening to improve the health and well-being of people, wildlife and the environment. This is an example of some of our achievements so far. We provide training courses for adults and children in a whole range of different areas about gardens and gardening and plants and the environment. So far, we've developed over 378 training courses, over 285 events and over 6,600 training days. Over 15,000 people have taken part in training. We've had almost 76,000 people engaging with the projects that we're involved with. Our training courses take place both at the Botanic Garden, but also at hub sites throughout Wales. They range from practical horticulture right through to the science of horticulture to arts and crafts using the natural environment and plants and gardens as their inspiration. 
We also have events, again, both at the Botanic Garden and throughout Wales, again, which tries to bring the beauty and inspiration of plants and gardens to enrich people's lives. The final project is Biophilic Wales, and this is a three-year project which has three different areas of work. One of them is to look at grasslands throughout Wales and the best way that we can monitor them using DNA barcoding. We have Plants for People, which is about celebrating Wales' natural heritage and protecting our rare plants. The final component of the project is called Inspiring Spaces and we're working with Swansea Bay University Health Board. Swansea is a city close to the Botanic Garden and we are working across a whole range of sites from big hospitals to health centres and clinics. And what we want to do is within those areas, working with volunteers, we want to improve those sites for biodiversity and for people. It might involve managing the grass differently so that we have more wildflowers, creating a relaxation area or using art to inspire people about the natural world. Now during lockdown, obviously we couldn't go out and about in the same way as we had done before, so we needed to adapt to what we were doing. We developed something called Join Our Growing Team. The idea of this is that people throughout Wales could be sent uh, packets of wildflower seeds and they could grow them in their own homes. Once those plants were grown, they could bring them to the Botanic Garden or take part in an event at one of the health board sites and plant those plants so that they could inspire people and have beautiful sites within our health board areas. We had thousands of people take part. We also said that hey, if you can't get to the Botanic Garden or you can't get to our health board sites, you can still grow these plants and enjoy growing them. We were overwhelmed with the response that we had. People sent us the most beautiful pictures and the most beautiful stories about the fact that growing seeds really helped them when they were in lockdown. It really helped them to connect with the natural world and see things changing, to see that there were things happening even if everything else around seemed rather chaotic. We'll continue with our projects now that lockdown is easing and we're gradually able to return once more to offering some of our courses and events both in person as well as online. Thank you for listening to the work that we're doing at the National Botanic Garden of Wales.